$2 trillion goes to the stock market, $460 million goes to America. There's, there's, where's the maths? It doesn't take a genius to work out you should give the large proportion of money to the people. I mean, the stock market is going to dump, but at least the people are still alive and happy and have health care. I mean, I'm not a big socialist. I'm far from it. But I know what's the difference between right and wrong. If you get rid of the people that can't pay the taxes to keep the government, then the government doesn't work anymore. Government has no more money. It's like when it comes to paying rent. The first bill that you should pay every month is the one that keeps the roof over your head. The taxpayers are the roof over the government's head. At this point, uh, it's clear that we are going to have a recession that's more severe than the global financial crisis. We are looking at other available options. More and more people are buying and holding Bitcoin. 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 Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Some call this digital gold. Everybody should probably have 1% of their assets in Bitcoin. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome to another awesome episode of Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have a returning guest, no one else than that martini guy, Jordan, a good friend and someone who we call the Sherlock Holmes of sniffing the BS in the crypto and blockchain space. But on top of that, Jordan has done many awesome things such as actually on top of technical analysis, sharing his real trades, showing that he has skin in the game and someone that you can really, really trust from that angle. So we're very happy to have Jordan back on the show. And before we start, a quick shout out to The Capital. Thank you for uh, sourcing all the questions. This is a great tool for finding quality content on the crypto space. So without further ado, let's crack on, Jordan. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? It's a pleasure to be invited into the interview room. I guess the interview room is actually my house now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sadly enough, we're not next to each other. But uh, if for those watching, we had a great interview with Jordan. Was it last summer, right? Was it maybe in July? It, last it was. It, well, it was when it was a bit warmer outside because we filmed it about 8 p.m. in the evening. And uh, it was still warm. Yeah, Towards the winter, actually. I think it was September. Oh, September. Yeah, really good interview, guys. Don't forget to check that. Jordan did, shared some really useful content on how to capture scammers and not to get scammed. So that was really, really good stuff. You should put a... Put a, a, a thing in the top corner here where you can click it. Yeah. Click the thing in the top corner. Click the thing in the top corner, guys, without doubt. By the way, Jordan, I'm drinking some really uh, nice tea. And I was wondering, is tea still the thing here in the UK or is the... I've never drank it. Ne ne no? Yeah, never drank it, never liked it. I drink coffee. Tea's, tea's not for me at all. Uh, but what have I got? I've got an energy drink that I know is terrible for you and a glass of water. So... <laughs> <laughs> the rebellious millennials changing the that that whole uh, uh, standard. So without further ado, Jordan, the first question I'd love to ask you is there's a saying that is really interesting that I've heard from many people I work with, which is we tend to be overly optimistic when there's risk, yet overly pessimistic when there's reward. So we're very irrational uh, people or creatures. And I would love yeah. to use that in context of the Bitcoin having and post having. Uh, what is your reaction to what's happening now? Could you please share your angle? Well, to be honest, I I was very surprised with the outcome of it. Bitcoin halving, I, you, when we had that massive price crash from 10000 all the way down to just under $4,000, that was quite obvious manipulation. It was it was whales taking advantage of the market 
in order to crash the price as low as possible to buy as cheap as possible where the retail well i mean obviously bitcoin is going to get blasted throughout the the news universe and people are going to start buying into the bitcoin halving idea um and, and people more people staying at home it's all influenced bitcoin's price probably rising above where it should be i mean to currently mine a bitcoin depending on what mining you're using and how much your electricity costs i'd say the average price is six thousand to eight thousand dollars which means that Bitcoin is overpriced. I mean, Bitcoin shouldn't be that far above what it costs to mine a Bitcoin at the moment. So there is an element of Bitcoin is still overvalued from, from where its actual real value sits. That's really interesting. And, and you talked about something that's really essential because it seems like the halving is only impacts one category or one angle, which are the miners. Is it mm -hmm. because, of course, we know that the supply is being cut, but it doesn't necessarily talk about buying pressure. Did we overhype this a little bit prior to the Incredibly. Habit? Like, the, the, the supply, uh, yes, it's been cut, but there has to be a demand for that supply in the first place, which we don't really have, because although, I mean, all my life is invested in this idea, it, it's still not there yet. And so because we're not there yet, Bitcoin is technically very much overvalued because if people are buying into an idea they're not buying into something that is actually all that useful i can't go to my local shop yet and pay with bitcoin i have to use a bitcoin debit card now yes it's a stepping stone but it's a fiat gateway in between the two once that fiat gateway has been removed and bitcoin is actually useful that means that bitcoin should be valuable well, it should have a lot of value by that point it's a question of how long does it take for bitcoin to become recognized as a financial asset rather than a commodity because i mean in the uk and europe we value it as a commodity one bitcoin is essentially valued in the same way as a bag of apples and uh well you can hand a bag of apples to anyone and it's tax-free same goes with bitcoin in this country you can hand a bitcoin to anyone it's tax-free um but if as soon as you cash out that bitcoin that's when you declare your taxes and that's where uh, the whole just it's just a horrible situation with tax in the uk and bitcoin but we don't need to get too deep into that it's just a there's so little regulatory regulatory framework for bitcoin at the moment for it, it it's not as valuable i think as people expect and i the having i don't actually think was particularly overhyped i think that it received the correct amount of hype and it got overvalued to the point where it wasn't ridiculous and i do believe that bitcoin will reach probably twenty thousand dollars this year and I think at some point like this year, it'll probably be worth that um, because of what's going on with the, the markets at the moment and where, where else can you put your money that's safe? That is so true, Jordan. And I love how you really specified that this was an event that mainly impacted uh, the miners, right? So it's just one small category out of met multiple angles. And you also put something really interesting with regards to Tether, which is a very strong hypothesis, which we'll keep for the end of the show. So guys, please... Make sure that you stay until the end. Jordan has some really interesting research on what really or truly impacts the price of Bitcoin, which is great. Uh, Jordan, if you don't mind, since we've been talking about the miners angle, it would be great to also talk about the whales, the institutional activity, the crypto enthusiasts and hodlers and the masses. Right. Well, I've got a good place to start with that, and that is CME Group's exchange. If you're not familiar with what CME Group is, it is the Chicago Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I think that's what it's called. Um, and anyway, so the CME Group have this institutional trading desk for Bitcoin. This is an institutional trading desk that is selling paper Bitcoin contracts, not real Bitcoin contracts. And therefore, there is there is a massive supply at the moment in Bitcoin of fake Bitcoin. Fake Bitcoin is actually way more popular than real Bitcoin is because Bitcoin as a use case, its most popular use case is trading. And so therefore you attract, during times of economic uncertainty, Bitcoin becomes something that is fairly, I guess, more certain than what's going on in the traditional markets. Everybody knows that traditional markets are going to crash. It's a case of when and how bad. And so those trades have been done. That, that, that market's finished for now. And then so you're moving over to something like Bitcoin, where the economy is still going strong, I suppose, because it's not really impacted that badly by what's going on in the traditional world. And so you end up with a bunch of large traders going over to these institutional exchanges. And if you look at the, the volumes for CME Group at the moment on Bitcoin futures contracts, through the roof, ridiculous volumes. Now, at the start of this year, they were doing one or two million dollars worth of volume a day. Now they're cracking 100 million on like certain days. I mean, the, the amount of money that is flowing through these institutional trading desks at the moment is beyond ridiculous 
And I honestly don't know why nobody's being arrested for it yet because there is obviously something weird going on. Yeah, that's incredible. And it's so true, like, because actually what Jordan is saying, guys, is in terms of research, the futures market exceeds the spot market by 10 to 15 X. So it's without doubt that the institutional activity is way more important than the having or things like that. Right, Jordan? Bitcoin is in a weird stage now whereby the retail market is, well, everybody is aware kind of, I guess, of what, of what Bitcoin is at this stage. And even if they don't know what it is, they at least know that they think it's a scam. That, that's that's an important thing because it's not difficult to, well, it is quite difficult to change someone's mind from thinking Bitcoin is a scam, but at least they are aware of it. So Bitcoin has come out of that stage where people don't know what it is to it's a weird thing that internet people use and we think it's a scam because we don't understand it. Now you can educate and help people understand it, but because Bitcoin is maturing and traditional financial markets are taking it more seriously, it, it's going to become, it's going to have more value. Because if Wall Street is using Bitcoin to transfer value between certain companies and, and, and using it as a trading asset, just like, I mean, what is the actual use of buying paper gold? Paper gold has no use case. Paper Bitcoin has no use case. It's just a financial instrument to trade. And because they're quite happy to trade that financial instrument, it shows that they've got trust that the value is not zero. And that in itself is a, a legitimizer for Bitcoin. I think that's quite an important point. That's a really important point, Jordan. And I know you were very vocal recently about economic activity and how the US, the UK, many countries are screwed, basically. And you just mentioned uh, just earlier something very interesting, which you were saying the real bull run could be triggered by the fact that the economic or current traditional markets are screwed. Is that where you see the most of the inflow of cash coming into Bitcoin or We've we've noticed it a lot, especially when it comes to crypto YouTube at the moment. Now, although I got banned the other day, um, before the ban, my YouTube channel was up around 100% on the month. And I'm not alone in this. Every single crypto YouTube channel is growing. Not growing like they were during the bull market of 2017, but because everybody's figures are up, there's obviously a new wave of people coming in. I strongly suspect those are professionals that are spending more time at home, less time doing real work, more time looking for alternative sources of income. And, and if you think about America's unemployment rate currently being uh, 20, 15% and they expect it to be 23% in the next couple of months, 23% of 400 million people unemployed. That's a lot of new customers, is that? And you only need... Um, what is what is it? So in order to increase Bitcoin's market cap, or rather Bitcoin's price by about one thousand dollars, you need about one hundred million dollars pumped into the market, kind of in a short period of time. Now, one hundred million dollars split across, uh, say, a hundred million people, that's, that's I guess that that's twenty three percent of the USA. So what, you, what I'm talking about here is there is a lot of new people coming into the space with ready cash. Now, because the financial problems haven't really hit that bad yet. And they will hit bad. Bitcoin is in this a, t a time where people are still spending to excess. The watch market hasn't died yet. The supercar market hasn't died yet. I mean, I bought one not that long ago, and the values still haven't changed in two months since I bought mine. And and again, for for watch market, that's that people are struggling to buy watches at the moment because nobody is really wanting to sell, and that's keeping the prices quite high. Now, eventually, all these luxury goods they're going to decline. And Bitcoin may get lumped in with that. And that's that's a big concern of mine. Is Bitcoin a store of value or it, is it a speculative asset? That will only be decided at the point when the, the luxury markets start crashing. We've seen it with, with several large chains in America at this point going bust. The, the large luxury chains, I forget what they're called. Um, but it's something that I guess only time will tell. Is Bitcoin speculative or is it digital gold? I don't think it's digital gold. I'd much prefer it to be cash. But... Again, we talked about this in the previous episode. I'm really not a fan of the Lightning Network. I think it's a terrible solution. Yeah, I remember that. You're really upset. And, and many people have actually uh, felt the same way recently at Consensus Virtual Conference where a lot of people were, were dissing the, the Lightning Network. But you raised a really good point, Jordan. And I think a lot of people would agree with you saying that it's the current economic conditions, quantitative easing, these economic stimulus packages that could be the real bull run for Bitcoin and not the having or short events, short term events like this. Uh, as you may know, and, and this is uh, thanks to one of our community members who shared with the, this on our Twitter feed. Um, in terms of printing money, the US has printed more in the past two months than the entire great financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. In two months, it surpassed two years 
of printing. Uh, how does that sound to you, Jordan? Well, not only that, but they offered up $3 trillion of worthless government bonds that the public could buy to essentially loan the government money because they can't print any more money because at that point you would have hyperinflation, essentially devaluing the nation's currency. Um, because currently there is a massive demand for dollars throughout the world. I mean, I've got uh, family in Ukraine, I've got family in Russia. Everybody is buying dollars at the moment with their currency because their currency is, is dying. Like, they're really struggling to maintain the value of their currency. The Grievna in, in Ukraine, it has struggled over recent years and it's just struggling even more now because the lockdown in Ukraine is so intense that, I mean, you're not allowed outside. If you go outside, you get arrested. That's how bad it is there. Well, rather good because it's working for them, but that's because their healthcare system can't cope with any amount of oversupply of customers, essentially. Also, it's a private healthcare system. It's not a public healthcare system. Mm, that's crazy. And, and so would that be this $2 trillion of printing in the past 60 days? Is that to you a sign of the most bullish indicator when it comes to Bitcoin's price? It's a sign to me that the US seems to have literally no idea how to deal with a financial crisis because they misallocated those funds. They spent, so of that $2 trillion that they printed, um, that, that all went into the stock market to maintain the value of the stock market. Why would they do that? They did that to basically, I, I, in my opinion, I believe that they did it to get out of their own personal positions because they weren't expecting a financial crash. So if you can increase the price, we saw with the Dow Jones index, it's starting to, to tip down again. If you can increase the price of the assets that you're invested in for a short enough period of time for you to get out of your own personal positions, then you're all happy. And at that point, then the market can dump because $2 trillion isn't going to be able to sustain a large sell-off in the stock market. It's just not going to be able to do it. Um, and, and I think that's a, a point that very few people seem to bring up because at the same time, they only allocated $460 million to the people of America. Now, so $2 trillion goes to the stock market, $460 million goes to America. There's, there's, where's the maths? Like, that's just so dumb. It doesn't take a genius to work out you should give the large proportion of money to the people. And, I mean, the stock market is going to dump, but at least the people are still alive and happy and have health care. I mean, I'm not a big socialist. I'm far from it. But I know what's the difference between right and wrong. And it makes sense to support the people that are paying the taxes to keep the government afloat. If you get rid of the people that can't pay the taxes to keep the government, then the government doesn't work anymore. The government has no more money. You support... You, you, it's, it's like when it comes to paying rent. You should always... The first bill that you should pay every month is the one that keeps the roof over your head. The same goes with the, the taxpayers are the roof over the government's head. Without the taxpayer paying the government money... The government can't keep the roof over its head and then they resort to these other silly ideas which is why we have these government bonds at the moment for the people to invest so the government can put more money into the stock market because that's 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 what we're left with when you inv it went, well I, i'm not the biggest fan of the man that is in charge there put it that way and i know that I mean, everyone's entitled to their own opinion and i'm very much a believer in in the free economies and free markets but i think that this man is doing a terrible job of managing it all now, that's a really good point because we can clearly see that the ultra high net worth or the very wealthy people and the gap between the middle class is getting larger and larger. And although some people do complain that by printing, we're stealing money from future generations for from kids who will have to pay those in taxes. You're right. The ratio doesn't make sense because we need to feed those families that will bring up the kids in the future. Right. Rather than yeah. focusing on the stock market. Well, I'm seeing it a lot where I live at the moment in London. There is. In where I live in the moment in London, there is, a, there is a large proportion of the very disproportionate wealth gap. So you've got your ultra rich and you're not rich at all and they live next to each other. And you're seeing it a lot at the moment, even in the buildings where I live, like people coming into the buildings and stealing stuff. This was not happening three months ago. So already in this country, the wealth gap seems to be increasing because these people have now not got jobs. They've got literally no hope for the next few years. So what else have you got to do to make money? And then, I mean, the government, the, the payouts that they're offering people, the furloughed payouts, they don't even come till June. So therefore, you've got to make it through from, from March till June to get your money. And then you've got nothing. Well, actually, they've extended it now till October. So happy days for all that you guys that can claim it. Unfortunately, I can't. But <laughs> um, yeah, the, these days, the wealth gap is is just mega i mean it creates a great investment opportunity in that middle market which is one of my plans going forward uh, especially in the in the property market because that's going to take quite a hit especially in the mid-range 
Um, Low-end housing is going to be very popular. High-end housing, probably not going to change the amount of demand for that. Might go down a little bit, but the, the middle class are going to be the ones that really suffer in all of this. Middle management, it's gone. That's really well put, Jordan. And I love it because you, you've actually, we've already covered institutional activity that in, that actually affects the price of Bitcoin. We've been talking about the masses. Uh, now, I would love to uh, add one point to the masses, which you're talking about earlier before the call. We were talking about Google Trends. And you had some really interesting information on what are the indicators that you believe affect the price of Bitcoin from a masses perspective. Do you mind sharing that once more? Yes. So the amount of people searching the word finance on Google has maintained a constant popular trend throughout history. Bitcoin has only managed to overtake it once, and that was in 2017. Currently, Bitcoin is about to overtake the word finance. So if you type in the word finance, you've got to think about how many times, like what the word finance covers. The word finance covers every single type of finance in the world, whether it be car finance, car mortgages. Finance is a very general term. So it gets searched a lot on Google. And yet Bitcoin is about to surpass finance in terms of the amount of people searching for it at the moment, indicating that a lot of people are probably looking for different alternative for sources of finance that you would not normally find by searching the traditional finance term on Google, which I find particularly interesting because it shows that I mean, obviously, Bitcoin is growing. Obviously, the Bitcoin community is growing. But that's further reinforcement that, I mean, the, you can see the inverse correlation between the two. One is quite clearly going down while the other is going up. So the, the, there is an obvious people stopping searching this and starting to search this, which means there is a, a switch between them. People are looking for these alternative sources because the traditional ones, the ones that have been around for centuries, they're no longer working as well. Mm, we've had, that makes a lot of sense. Two, two big financial crashes in the space of 10 years. Like, my, my parents didn't have one, a, a major one, I guess, their entire lives up until 2008. I mean, there was a little bit one with Margaret Thatcher, I guess, just before that. But before, there's not really been a great one since the Great Depression. We're going to have a Great Depression. That's inevitable right now. That's a really good point. So just to summarize that, so we talked about how the having is very specific to supply only and miners. We talked about institutional activity, the masses. When it comes to the masses, a lot of people have been telling me about the crypto fear and greed index. Have you heard of that index, which kind of takes half technicals, but also social sentiment or social media or community sentiment to figure out if the, the bar is actually in the fear zone. That means that you should buy. If it's in the greed zone, that means you should sell. Have you ever used that indicator and does that help? You I have bit? used that indicator in a different way. I poll my audience on Twitter. Quite on a regular basis, I ask them if they're bullish or bearish. By the way, you can follow me at Martini Guy YT. Um, that YT stands for YouTube, by the way. I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> um, but so I poll my audience on 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 Twitter and I poll them on YouTube. If you can find out if your audience is bullish or bearish, I mean other YouTubers do it as well. Then you can get an accurate representation of active traders in crypto, whether they are bullish or bearish. If you've got a high proportion of people that are bullish, then odds are you're coming towards the top of the the. Well, it's almost time to short, basically, if you've got 70% that are bullish. If it's 50-50, which majority of the time it is, it shows that things are going quite well and the direction is probably going to continue um, if there's not much more fear or not much more greed. Um, you're looking for more of an equilibrium. And in that case, generally, the direction will continue on in the same direction. But I do think it's a really interesting indicator and it's historically quite accurate. Quite accurate, yeah. Is that one of the best indicator for crypto enthusiasts, mainly, rather than the masses? Uh, and is Twitter the, the main hub for you for getting that type of information on the community sentiment since there are many crypto enthusiasts on Twitter? Twitter is an interesting group of people, certainly more pleasant than Reddit. I have not had a good experience with the crypto Reddit community. They, for some reason, don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, on Twitter, I mean, I think Twitter is a really good medium of communicating with people. Increasingly, Instagram is even better than Twitter, I would say. Probably because it's easier to get a message across in just a quick 15-second video done. You don't need to type anything. A few hundred people watch it, and those few hundred people maybe go on to tweet something or tell someone else. Um, Twitter is really good for getting things in the eyes of people. But in terms of, is it the best medium? I'd say pff, yes at the moment, but I think that there's a, a lot of good mediums for crypto. Telegram, I think, is one of the worst, to be honest. It encourages people to hide behind uh, fake profiles and, and do stupid things. Many scammers uh, as well, yeah. 
Too many scammers. Way too many scammers. In, in fact, on Instagram, it's even worse than... I mean, Instagram's the worst platform for scamming at the moment. There's what, if you could type into that martini guy on, on Instagram, there'd probably be six or seven fake profiles, and I, tr I get probably one taken down every week because it's very difficult to get them taken down. Um, but yeah. That's an interesting point. Now, moving to the Bitcoin whales. So a lot of people are very... have uh, many concerns about how whales can move the markets quite easily. There's some coordination, some whales syncing with each other to manipulate price. Now that Bitcoin has gone up in, val in value, do you think they have less manipulation? And where do you like to look at in terms of sources to see, to track the whale movement? I use whale alerts. I feel like the whales are firmly in charge of the price at the moment. There is so many new uneducated people entering the space based on the fact that they think that the price will come up. Um, so that probably means that the price is going down. <laughs> and and, and it, I, it means that the whales are in control. If you notice the way that Bitcoin's price is moving at the moment, there is an awful lot of tether printing, which we will get onto in a moment. But every time the price starts going upwards, bam, straight downwards. Why is someone making that go straight downwards? And why is it so frequent at this point? It's because that's probably the best long-term long -term position to have. It's not because someone is selling their position. These are people that... Are, 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 basically emptying their own pockets uh, because that's where the top is for now. They'll buy it back much cheaper. But if you can dump the price maybe only three or $400 and then you know that the tether machine is going to buy it back up, then you may as well dump your bags because you know that you've got a lot more to... The whales, are basically, what I'm trying to say is are the only ones that have any control over the market. Um, and this is such a shame for Bitcoin that the, the wealth is so centralized at the top. Um, I can't remember what the, the, the fact is, but is it... It, there is a top 1% in Bitcoin. What is it? 1% on 75% of the supply or something stupid. It's like it is in real world. Could you would Is Bill Gates able to crash the world economy? Probably. That's, it, so Bill Gates is kind of in control. Does Bill Gates have more power than Donald Trump? Arguably, yes. There's, these things happen in both societies. And this is definitely a concern, like you're saying, uh, Jordan, because whales have been increasing, right? They've been increasing their actual... Uh, position in Bitcoin, we can see that there are more whales, up to 26% of all Bitcoin is held by a whale. So someone who has more than a thousand Bitcoins in their wallet. So is that a concern for you that the whales are accumulating and, and actually manipulating the price? It's the free market. <laughs> I can't say that I like it, but it's the free market. Um, I believe that we should be much more equally distributed, but equal distribution will only come when the price increases. Um, you That's how Bitcoin, the whole model is designed around price increases, some guy liquidates his assets, and then those Bitcoins get distributed among other people. The problem is, those people that got very rich in the early days are still rich now. And those guys still have a lot of Bitcoin. And because they're invested in the ideology, they also hold a lot of power over the network. And, and then you end up with this decentralized system that actually has very centralized power structures, like with Blockstream, like with... Uh, well, basically, every major Bitcoin core player has a lot of Bitcoin and therefore has a lot of say over what the network does. And I think this, again, leads on to the whole scaling problem of I've got more Bitcoin than you. And if you say that you don't agree with what my idea is, I will sell my Bitcoin and crash the price. It's a, such a centralized thing at the same time as being very decentralized. And so over time, those people will get, they'll sell all the coins and that'll be nice. But you need this redistribution of wealth. Um, and they need to redistribute into dollars. Bitcoin can't exist without dollars, I don't think. I've come, kind of come to realize that. We can never have a system without traditional fiat currency. We can have the two working in equilibrium between each other. Like, for example, if I want to pay someone in China, I can pay someone in China with Bitcoin. It's so much easier to pay in Bitcoin. But in a traditional me and you paying each other, I mean, fiat is probably the best way of doing that, to keep a, keep a log of transactions that on a, on a tax, taxable basis. It's a, it's a very interesting question, and I, I don't quite know what the, the correct solution to it is. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about redistribution of wealth. Hopefully, we, there will be a better distribution of wealth. Uh, obviously, there are many wallets these days. I believe we've surpassed 40 million Bitcoin wallets, which is quite exciting. But I, I love this interview so far, uh, Jordan. We've covered institutional activity, the Bitcoin whales, the miners, the crypto enthusiasts, and the masses. So really looking at the Bitcoin price from every single angle possible, which leads me to one of the most exciting angles and something that you've tweeted about recently, which is the crypto exchanges and more specifically Tether. 
So there was a lot of controversy, as you know, Jordan, some people saying that, you know, this is one of the most important price indicators. Some people denying, no, it's not exactly true. But recently, there have been some quite uh, straightforward conclusions. Do you mind educating us on how Tether is impacting the price? Of so Bitcoin? just off the top of my head, over the past four or five days since filming, since before filming this video, there was about $400 million of Tether that's been printed that I've just seen, like, that's a lot of money, especially when you consider how small this space is. $400 million goes a long way to increasing Bitcoin's price to probably being, if it all went into the market at the same time, thirty dollars to $40,000. I would say that if you pumped all that money into the market at the same time, you'd just kill all of those sell walls. Because all you've got to remember, all of the sell walls in Bitcoin are fake. People don't actually want to sell that Bitcoin. They'd mainly do it just to push the prices downwards. That's why people put big sell walls up. Um, they don't actually fill those positions. There's no one to fill them to. And and so because all of this tether is being printed at the moment is very indicative of what is going on with the regulatory framework around the world. Tether have been investigated so many times in the past. In fact, they passed the last time that they were investigated. They got the all clear. Everything is good to go. Um, but we will investigate you again in the future. And now... There is a lot on the SEC's plate at the moment with regards to there'll be a lot of liquidation of companies, a lot of liquidation of assets, a lot of problems going into the financial sector. So the SEC is going to have a lot more, uh, it's going to be a lot busier than it was six months ago when we were investigating Tether. So Tether is now have been handed the keys to the bank again and they are enjoying having the keys to that bank because they seem to be printing as much money as humanly possible. And then I don't know whether, they don't seem to be putting it straight into Bitcoin. They seem to be rather... I, the whole tether machine has always been built to back the coins that it prints. So say that you print $1, if you buy that $1 worth of Bitcoin and then sell that Bitcoin into anything, then you have now that $1 to back that $1 that you originally printed. That's the way the tether is, I mean, that's the way that it, it was suspected but never found guilty of printing money off in the first place. And I strongly suspect that they're doing that again. And it's not difficult to get around any SEC law if you've got enough money and you can fill up some lobbyists' pockets and uh, happy days, you're on your way. It, the, the, the system is broken, is basically what I'm saying. And it's broken as much in crypto as it is in the traditional world. Because the same thing goes on there with the government printing money and just saying, oh, well, here's some more money. Here's some more money. We're having hyperinflation in crypto at the moment because they're printing unlimited fake dollars. And it's so true. And for those who kind of question Tether's ability to pump the price of Bitcoin. The correlation is, has been quite incredible in the past month. As uh, Jordan was talking about, over a billion dollars in the past month and a half was printed in Tether USDT. You can see every time there was a minting uh, situation, you can see the price of Bitcoin go up. But uh, uh, is that how you see it, like Jordan, as you know, basically Tether is the QE of the crypto space? Is that how you're seeing it at the moment? I think Tether as a system is outdated. I think Tether belongs in 2017 and we should all stop using it. Um, I, I, there are much better systems out there. USDC is a better system. It's more regulated. TUSD is a better system. It's more regulated. Tether is a system. It is, it is kind of the root of all Bitcoin's problems because it, it keeps the status quo as it is. Bitcoin is a network that needs to consistently change. It needs to consistently redistribute wealth. People need to be buying things with the coins, not just holding the coins, if Bitcoin is to be a cash rather than a store of value. If Bitcoin is a store of value, fair enough, but we need a consensus agreement on that. Otherwise, you get with this wishy-washy nonsense between the two and... Lightning Network is not a good solution for a cash system unless it's integrated in everything. I know you get these people that say, oh, Lightning Network's fine. It's so much faster. Right, fine, exactly. But can your grandma use it? No, she can't. So then we'll have to wait till she dies. And then the same system. Can my parents use it? No, they don't want to learn how to use it. We need something better. It's not just okay to go, well, I know how to use it. Are you thick? That's not a solution. Half of, like, I'd, I'd say in my experience... There are many, many dumb people in the world, and I probably include myself in that category. We're all educated on singular topics. And so a topic that you don't understand, you don't really want to know to learn. And so I, I know I've branched out from the original point here about Tether, but Bitcoin as a thing is completely flawed unless you sort out the wishy-washy nonsense between is it a store of value or is it digital cash? If it's a store of value, happy days, you only need your seven transactions a second. But if it's cash... You need a lot more than seven transactions a second because MasterCard does what twenty eight thousand transactions a second. We're far away from cash. No, 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 no one's even got close to cash in this space.
That's true. That needs to be clarified and perhaps an intersection or the best of both worlds. I don't know how that will end up, but we, we actually have that with Bitcoin SV. And as much as people don't like Bitcoin SV and I myself am not the biggest fan of Craig, I've made plenty of videos stating that I'm not the biggest fan of Craig uh, as, as a cash system. BSV actually works better because it's it's faster, bigger box. Why didn't why the, the, everything seems to yeah too too much too many opinions too many cooks spoiling the broth. It needs to be an authoritarian leadership in in Bitcoin. And as as weird as that sounds with such a decentralized currency, having too many opinions just does not seem to work for Bitcoin. And I'm gonna get slated for that in the comment section below. <laughs> But Satoshi <laughs> forgot about that one, didn't he? He should, he should have, uh, he should have said, "I'm, I'm leading, I'm leading this." He, instead of ditching his project and leading it to, the, leaving it to the masses, should have said, "I'm king, king of Bitcoin." Me. There's definitely a lot of conflict in terms of views and Bitcoin maximalism, and people who see their own world and don't look at other worlds are not open to opinions. So hopefully that will get better in the future. So, but just for those to understand this tether point and and how critical it is, as Jordan is saying is Tether is not mainly used as a safe haven, it's used to add liquidity in a fiat position. So mainly the, the big institutional, the big institutions, the whales use Tether as a way to put in more money in the system. So uh, is that correct, Jordan, where uh, Tether is not a safe haven, it's actually used for people to get bigger positions uh, and have the liquidity for those positions. And that's the main reason why it pumps the price of Bitcoin. Yes and no. I use, me personally, I use Tether as a safe haven. Um, I know I shouldn't. I should use, I, I, I use USDC and I use Tether. I stopped using TUSD because there's too few trading pairs for it. I personally think that T, USDT should be delisted from everywhere, but that's beside the point. It's the most liquid one of all, of all the Ethereum um, nonsense tokens that are all worth $1. Um, so Tether is kind of a safe haven, but at the same time, the, I guess the main use case for Tether is just to pump. There's, there's, there is one main use case that Tether has proven itself quite good at, and that is increasing the price of Bitcoin. Above anything else, I'd say that's mo its most popular use case. That's, that's why people, no one is minting Tether because they prefer Tether to the actual dollars in the bank. Everyone prefers dollars in the bank. There's, why would you prefer this Ethereum shitcoin? You wouldn't. You prefer dollars in the bank uh, because because people go, oh, they're real. Okay. Well, yeah, te te technically that's true because Tether, although it's been proven to be backed, is it still backed? How, where is the evidence, this like $1 billion that's been printed over the cost past month or however much it is, is, is actually real? Like, where is the bank account proving this? Because last time it was proven that the people that were running the bank account were scammers. So how can we trust anything that this company says we can't because they've proven to be liars um so jordan uh thank you so much for sharing that with regards to tether so i think it's really important i think the lesson we can learn throughout this interview is really that there are multiple angles to look at when it comes to supply and demand right and we cannot look at just the bitcoin having and just think okay bitcoin's going to the moon for a singular event that affects a single angle of the entire crypto ecosystem but I would love to ask you, Jordan, what are your favorite trading signals uh, or indicators as of uh, these days? Uh, I remember um, the moon, uh, so Carl from the moon, who actually mentioned that the 20 weekly moving average was his single most favorite indicator. Of course, it's always a combination of multiple indicators. But are there any uh, technical analysis indicators that you really like these days? Well, for me, I like to keep it as simple as possible. I've programmed many trading bots. And when you program a trading bot, you're looking at very simple uh, algorithms and very, very simple things that change in charts uh, because trading bots, you don't make them that complex. And the majority of people that use trading bots don't make them that complex. Uh, and so therefore, and because most of Bitcoin's trading volume at this point is provided by institutions which use trading bots that aren't very complex, you've got to keep it simple. So therefore, for me, when programming a trading bot, you would use MACD, RSI, perhaps perhaps a moving average, um, and then basic trading formations, uh, just teach you to recognize those. So I, I always go with the most simple form of trading, for me, is the most accurate. People can overcomplicate it with as many things as you'd like, but the thing is, when you start introducing all these other factors into your trading, you end up with a very convoluted answer to what the, the because you're, you're just trying to problem solve. You're just trying to work out which direction the price is going to go. And so if you can end up with the same, well, the most consistent answers rather than 
convoluted answers going, well, this one thinks it's going to go up and this one thinks it's going to go down. Well, you're better off just sticking with the one, like just a few as possible. And you could say, well, then you'll end up with a very, you, you're going to always be looking in the same direction for the Bitcoin's price. I, I find that you just having MACD is enough. You don't, I mean, MACD is a moving average convergence divergence and RSI means relative strength index. Um, both of the two, I mean, moving average convergence divergence is essentially like having a moving average that you're trading against, but it, it's, it's in a, a little line at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the two cross over each other and one indicates bullish and the other indicates bearish. Uh, it's very simple trading. And, and that's that's all the bots do. They look at it on a, a small time frame, a large time frame. You take a, an overall analysis of what they're all saying and go, well, that's, that's the direction it's going to head. And for me, it's worked historically very, very well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, brother. And for those who want to follow you, if you just want to share once again, you're active on Twitter, I know. You have awesome videos on YouTube. And, and mm -hmm. they're, they're great because you're very opinionated and you take a strong firm on what you're saying. So it mm -hmm. really shows rather than being in the middle. So that's really, really cool. Uh, yeah, what, where should we follow you and where can we get in touch with you? That Martini Guy on YouTube, The Martini Guy. Now you've got to make, remember there is a The on Instagram. Some idiot took that, so I'm stuck with The. Uh, I am That Martini Guy. And then on Twitter, it's Martini Guy YT because, again, someone took That Martini Guy unfortunate and and none of the platforms will let me have them despite the people that have my username being inactive for years but uh, that's a different matter for a different day <laughs> if you're that guy reach out and please give that domain back to the martini guy. i'll pay him i'll give you 100 pounds for it <laughs> thank you so much jordan and guys so thank you so much for watching if there were any technical analysis indicators or non-technical analysis indicators that you guys find are very relevant to finding the price or indicating the price of Bitcoin in the future, don't forget to put them in the comment section below. Like, blast that bell notification, and join us every week, 8 o'clock BST, premiering at a PC near you. Thank you so much, Jordan, for coming on the show, buddy. No problem. It's been my pleasure. All right. Take care, buddy. Take care, guys.